Well, we're going to learn a little bit about EDM resin today. So hopefully, uh, if you have any questions at the end, uh, be sure to ask. Otherwise, you can meet me out at the table. Um, my name is Bruce Iverson. I'm the founder and owner of uh, Nationwide DI Water Solutions. I've been in business for 38 years. Um, I've been in the water treatment business doing the DI re regenerations uh, for the whole 38 years as far as working with the EDM machines and stuff and working with Makino and other um, companies and OEMs and stuff in the business. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the business and stuff and then uh, I've get, there's about five slides and then uh, I think there's about total of 20 slides we'll be going through, but I'll tell you a little about the business itself and then we'll go into the, the resin and the regeneration process and some of that stuff. So um, Nationwide DI, the main warehouse, uh, we're in Elgin, Minnesota. Uh, we currently have a little over 13,000 square feet, eight employees. Um, our regeneration facility for EDM, we do have a 60 cubic foot plant that we use. We do about 180 cube per day. So if you're looking at the tanks that they have out here on the machines and stuff, that's about 180 of them tanks we do per day, five days a week. We've been, uh, we've been in business since 2010. So we've been, been in business myself 2010, but I've been doing it since 1985, so. Um, we have another warehouse in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, that's 5,000 square feet. We've got a couple employees there. What we do there is uh, basically it's just a warehouse. It's uh, where we uh, bring in product from the southeast, all the uh, south, southern states, southeast states, and we take the resin, <coughs> exhausted resin, and we replace it with regenerated resin that gets shipped from Minnesota. We do truckloads back and forth. So they'll get a fresh truckload of regenerated resin. Same time, it just does a turnaround and we get a full truck of exhausted resin back to regenerate. Um, between all of us employees, we've got over 90 years of experience in the EDM business and the resin regeneration. So some of the services that we offer our clients and stuff uh, we it's a we kind of pride ourselves on quality regeneration of our resin and stuff uh, we sell virgin and regenerated resin uh, every batch that before it goes out to the customer or if it goes out to sst everything is tested before it actually leaves our facility so it meets the needs of the customer and stuff so when they're hooking that tank or bottle or whatever it is up to that machine, uh, they're gonna get the quality of water that they need for that machine. We, uh, we actually, as a company, we actually go out of our way to provide the best service we can um, for the customers. Um, most of the time, if there's a problem with uh, a tank that the customer gets, they'll go back to their consumable dealer. Uh, sometimes we'll just, consumable dealer will call me, but I'll, after we talk, sometimes I'll just have the customer call me direct so we can try to figure out what's going on instead of having that middleman. And uh, Makino SST has been pretty good about uh, letting me talk directly to the customers when there's issues and stuff. So we, um, rapid turnaround. So when we get product in from customers, whether it's a, the OEM or whether it's a customer, we try to turn that product around uh, within a couple business days. So if a customer gets in trouble and stuff with a product or machine goes down, they always have a resin to run that machine. Um, we always carry a well-stocked warehouse uh, with DI cells, the fiberglass tanks, heads, um, all the accessories as far as conductivity lights, uh, screen traps to catch resin and stuff. Um, we have all that stuff in stock at all times. So in the EDM resin, there's two types of resin in that bottle. One is cation resin, which is a positive anion. It's a positive ion, so it's, it catches. Your cation is 
the resin that catches all the heavy metals when you're running your machines and stuff. And the anion resin, it's a negative charge. So with them two resins mixed together, they work together, removing different materials out of the water to make that water pure water. So when you're cutting with your electrical pulses and stuff underneath the water, it cannot conduct any electricity. Um, that's the purpose of the, that deionized water. Um, cation is regenerated with hydrochloric acid. Anion is regenerated with sodium hydroxide, caustic soda. Um, with the cation, you can use a, you can use a sulfuric acid for regeneration. It's, uh, it's less expensive than the hydrochloric, but uh, there's problems with uh, using that sulfuric acid. It can cause uh, calcium sulfate buildup on the resin beads. So we prefer to use a hydrochloric acid in our facility. It just uh, seems to work a little better on the regenerations uh, for quality. So here's a, here's a picture of uh, the EDM regeneration uh, plant there. Uh, tank A is uh, the backwash separation tank. B would be the anion uh, regeneration and rinse tank. C is the cation regeneration and rinse tank. D is the mixing and rinse tank. And E is uh, that's a rinse, rinse water storage tank. I'll kind of go through the process with you. Um, so that process we have is that backwash tank. We take all the resin that comes in from the customers and whether it's 55 gallon drums of bulk resin we get, if it's resin tanks, uh, bags, we take all that resin and we put it into that bar, uh, backwash tank. After it's all loaded up 60 cubic feet, we actually go into a backwash mode where we take water and we upflow the resin from the bottom of that tank and we actually flush that resin and we take all the dirt and stuff out of that resin and it goes out the top. Meanwhile, them two resins, one's cation, one's anion, the cation's heavier than the anion. So the cation will sink, anion will float on top, and you bec it, there becomes a really distinct line between the two resins. Once that's backwashing, that we do about 40 gallons a minute, once that's backwashing and you get that distinct line, we take the cation resin off the bottom, which is comes off the bottom and we actually put the cation resin in its own vessel. And after that cation resin is, cation tank is full, there's a middle pipe here that comes off the middle section, which we can now separate and put the anion in that, it's tank, uh, tank B. After that is done, we actually uh, take the chemical is a 5% anion, or a, it's a 5% sodium hydroxide for the anion, and it's a 5% uh, hydrochloric acid for the cation. And we actually do a downflow of that chemical solution through the resin beads, and there's a certain contact time that that chemical has to be in for that uh, resin beads to uh, regenerate. And them two streams then, the waste streams then actually go into a waste tank. It's about a 5,000 gallon waste tank. Them two streams go into, um, and we'll talk about the waste of that streams a little later, but after that is regenerated with uh, chemicals, we then rinse with uh, pure water using reverse osmosis water, and then it gets polished with DI tanks. So we're actually rinsing all them beads and that chemical out with pure water once that is done, everything gets remixed in the tank D, the remix tank. And after that's remixed, it gets dumped into a dewatering tank. So the water all drains out. And at that time, it's ready to fill into tanks, totes, whatever we got to do. So now the, the wastewater, them two streams from the cation and anion, You've got a low pH of, of hydrochloric acid, and then you've got a high pH of sodium hydroxide caustic. So you got one at 14 pH, you got one at one. So by mixing them two streams together, 
they're actually neutralizing each other. So when we're all done and we have to re we're doing our waste, that pH is usually around nine or 10 instead of being way up 14 or zero. So then we actually have to do a pH adjustment of, uh, we do a pH adjustment about nine and then we add a polymer to it. And the polymer helps it settle the metals and stuff out. It actually grabs the metals and stuff and it'll, it'll sink it to the bottom of the tank and it's a cone bottom tank. So all that waste gets pumped through a, a sludge press and uh, that waste is then filled into a cake that uh, it, we make and then it's disposed of through a licensed and certified landfill. Resin properties and water quality. Water quality is measured either by conductivity um, or resistivity. Your conductivity is measured in micromoles or microsiemens and your resistivity is measured in ohms. So most of your EDM machines actually have a monitor on them. There is another way that some of the customers will, they'll do a conductivity light. It's a, you'll, I've got one out on my table out there. They'll put it after the, the DI tank and it's a red green light. It's a 50,000 ohm light. So when that light is green, the resin is still good. If it turns red, it's time to switch that tank out. Uh, we sell a lot of those, um, but I know, I think all the machines actually have the, the uh, sensor on it. It should be noted that uh, the natural interaction between CO2 and in the air and water in the dielectric system, it will produce small amounts of carbonic acid, which will eventually result in your pH of your work tank going down to probably five or six. So now your solution in your work tank is more on the acid side. So let's say it's a long weekend, holiday weekend or something, and that machine stays idle, and that work tank is just sitting out in the open. Just by sitting out in the open, DI water is very aggressive because it's pure. It'll, it sucks all that CO2 from the air into the work tank, and it'll actually make your pH lower in that work tank. So there are some issues that people have depending on what they're working with and stuff. Uh, they'll have to start that ma machine up on Monday if, or whenever and let that run through to correct that pH. Nationwide DI, we use a 60-40 mix with uh, the resins. So we do 60% anion and we do a 40% cation. And the reason uh, that we do that is because the cation resin outlasts the anion. So if, you do, if you're doing a 50-50 mix, you're going to get less life because that cation is gonna go dead before the, or no, the anion is gonna go dead before the cation. So we always do a mix 60-40, so basically both resins go dead at the same time. If you're doing a 50-50, what happens is that water, they call it, it, it goes sour because now your anion is completely dead. And now it's only running on cation, which uh, isn't going to be good for you. So we use a 60-40 mix. Makeup water. So we use, uh, some customers will use makeup water tank. So it's a separate tank that they'll have hooked up to their well water or their city water. And it basically is for adding for evaporation uh, in their work tanks. Um, instead of using direct city water or well water, you're, uh, you're adding makeup water out of a DI tank. So now you're actually adding good water to the DI tank and you're not having, if you add the well water, city water, you may have to sit there for half hour, 40 minutes and let that run because you got, now you got to make that city water into DI water and the, the resin's got to remove all the impurities out of that for it to actually machine to run for you. If you're using a makeup water bottle, you're a adding DI water and you can actually start running right away. So we have a lot of people that are doing that. And we actually are doing some of these makeup water bottles uh, for, uh, I believe, CNC machines for mixing coolants and stuff. Tanks, heads, and fittings. Uh, there's uh, several configurations. Uh, we can do about anything anybody asks. 
Um, but uh, the main one that uh, Makino likes to use is the, is the Camelot quick di disconnect one. Um, we do the garden hose fittings. Basically, they're just both uh, male garden hose. Uh, we do the gardenia fittings. You'll see them on some machines uh, that come over from uh, Europe and stuff. They're quick dis disconnects also. Um, these are probably the, the better heads, these uh, PVC molded heads. They're a lot tougher and stronger. They don't crack. Um, there is this plastic clock head that we do sell. Um, it's not very common, but it, does, it comes out the top. Some people like them coming out the top. Um, this is what we call the CH head, which it has the elbows that come out the top. Carbon. Um, there's some people that like to use carbon tanks uh, before the DI. Uh, carbon is actually used to remove chlorine. So um, your DI resin does not like chlorine. It'll exhaust a lot faster if uh, some of your city water that you're using is ran through the DI. It'll exhaust the DI a lot faster. So a lot of people are use a carbon tank in front of that DI, or even if, it, if they're using a makeup water bottle tank, they'll do a carbon tank and then they'll do the makeup bottle because they're removing the chlorine before it hits the DI. We actually use a, a coconut shell carbon, uh, which is a plant-based uh, carbon. It's a little cleaner than other types of activated carbon that's used. So this resin screens, uh, if you guys are, anyone's running EDM machines and they've got DI tanks on the machines, they should have a resin screen trap on the outgoing of that DI tank. If you don't have one, I would recommend putting one on. Um, it's, it's a very uh, inexpensive insurance policy. If anybody has ever had resin beads that they have had to tear down a machine to remove all them little resin beads and all the little orifices, it's a, it's a day, two day job. Um, you're, you're not gonna be very happy. You're probably gonna call me and say, hey, your DI tank just exploded and my machine is down for two days. And this stuff all gets shipped and they get thrown around and we can't see inside these tanks if something got damaged either by UPS or if someone's throwing it around in the shipping and stuff. And these riser pipes in these tanks, sometimes they'll get snapped. Um, and so basically we don't take any responsibility as far as when this stuff happens inside the vessel because we actually, before each tank gets shipped out and filled, we go through the head, we take compressed air, we clean out all the screens, we look at the distributor tube, we make sure everything is correct before it goes out and gets refilled. So if one of them are broke, and you have a screen on, that's all the further is going to go. It's not going to go into your machine. And uh, like I said, it's a very cheap, inexpensive insurance policy. So exhausted uh, DI resin that is loaded with contaminants and removed from the water, basically the responsibility goes on the, the company that is producing them heavy metals. It's kind of, in the, in the United States, they call it cradle to grave. So even though that I'm, I'm licensed to accept this waste and I'm doing the regenerations and stuff, I, I have to follow all kinds of guidelines. So I, can't, I gotta make sure that I don't send anything that I shouldn't down the drain. But just so everybody knows that it, it's where the waste is produced is who is ultimately responsible for dealing with that waste in, a, in the correct manner, you know, as far as uh, getting it to a licensed uh, regeneration facility or a licensed landfill, whatever you're doing with it, uh, instead of just throwing it in the dumpster. So yeah, so the, the best thing to do with resin, uh, if, you're not gonna, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna regenerate it, you send it to a licensed landfill. Uh, we have our permit listed on our website. It can be printed off. Um, anyone at SST Makino can actually get that for you. Um, everything is done within uh, the EPA regulations. 
Um, we are tested at our facility 24 hours, seven days a week uh, with a composite sample that goes out the door. So we're, we have to do a, our due diligence to uh, make sure we're not sending anything we shouldn't. So T-clip testing, uh, some customers, not too many, um, have asked for a, a T-clip test uh, of their resin, basically. It's just a test uh, that is ran through a lab uh, testing the heavy metals that they are considered hazardous waste. Um, we test our resin every, every year we have to test our sludge before it goes to the landfill every year we have to test it and for all this stuff. So um, we have never had a problem with any of the heavy metals uh, considered uh, hazardous waste as far as disposal. It's the only thing we really deal with at our facility is zinc and copper, which is coming from your, the wire, the coated wires and stuff you're cutting with. So that's just a, that's a copy of our permit and everything. We do use, uh, we do reuse a lot of our water and stuff in our facility, and we actually reuse some of the chemicals and stuff. So we try to cut down on our carbon footprint ourselves by uh, reusing uh, as much as we can uh, so we're not just dumping it down the drain. So some resin tips. It's, it's more like, uh, I don't know if it's resin tips or not, but uh, it's um, all your machines in your work tanks, you guys all have uh, conductivity probes that are located in the machine tank, in the work tanks. So I don't know, you know, if you, if you don't have a regular process where you clean them probes and stuff, or at least wipe them off every once in a while, they, they will get coated with a slime and stuff, depending on how well you're maintaining your equipment and stuff. But if you don't have them sensors cleaned off, I mean, your machine's only going to work as well as, you know, you're, you're getting false information if you're not cleaning them probes off on a regular basis or cleaning your tanks out, whatever the manufacturer says, your work tanks, cleaning them out uh, when they need to be. Over time, there'll be a slime or a scum that builds up on the inside of them work tanks, which is, it's a bacteria, which will affect your cutting and everything. So it's just one of them things. Uh, install safety screens on the outlets of your systems. Uh, we talked about that. So your machines uh, don't get plugged up with resin beads and you're down for two or three days with two guys cleaning it up. Um, some of your resin tank systems, uh, I've seen where customers have actually taken, you got the DI tank, but before that DI tank, there are some shops that have taken the little blue household filters and they'll actually install them before that resin tank because that just, that actually helps a lot because a lot of times your filters that you're using on your machines, if you get a blown filter or something or let's say the filters aren't working, you've got a high micron filter, you, maybe you should have spent a little more money and got a lower micron filter. Well, if you're not filtering that water correctly, coming out of your machine, going to the DI tank, now your DI tank is becoming a filter. And your DI tank is not a filter. Your DI resin is based, it's, it's, uh, it's there to produce pure water for your cutting. Uh, I get, I get DI tanks into the shop and when I open them up and I grab a handful, I, I, my hand's black with grease. Some of them, they're, they're, they're that bad. I have to use a cleaning solvent and stuff to get it off my hands. And uh, your DI tanks should not look like that. But what's happening is the machine, the filters or whatever are not working on that machine. Now the resin's the filter and your resin's becoming exhausted a lot quicker and then I have more issues on my end too. So, um, you know, try not to skimp on your filters. I mean, I, there's always recommendations on what you should be using on your machines and stuff for filters because uh, it's, uh, it's just gonna cost you more money in the long run. Um, cleaning chemicals. Some people are using, they use a cleaning chemical or they use, uh, oh, Kevin, what am I thinking? In their tank, their work tank. Now for, um, so the metals don't rust when they pull them out. Uh, oh, uh, um, a, a 
Yeah, rust inhibitors. So rust inhibitors are fine to use, but you know, make sure you use them correctly with the, what they say, because I've seen people where instead of measuring it out, they just dump it in. And um, it's, it's not good for the resin because that actually will go through the machine, it goes through the filters, and then it ends up in my resin. And when I dump the resin or try to suck the resin out of that tank, it's like slime. I mean, you could hold, you could ha hold a handful of resin and it'd be a slime going to the ground. So it, it's just, it's, and it, it's not good to be working with. So basically the resin system of the EDM is one of those that are out of sight, out of mind. You know, usually people don't think much about the resin because they're busy running the machine, making parts and stuff. But, uh, you know, a proper understanding of the basics of the ion exchange process and the regeneration process is potential environmental liabilities help maintain the EDM consistency and can keep you on the right side of the law or the EPA and stuff. And uh, I think uh, by doing all that stuff, uh, your machine's probably just gonna be a lot healthier. So I wanna thank everybody for uh, attending. I'm hoping you learned something about EDM resin and how it works and stuff. I guess I'd like to thank Makino and SST for uh, allowing me to be here and present to you guys and hopefully share some of the information that I've gathered over the years. So thank you guys.